before we start our episode today, this is just a reminder, History Hack does have a Patreon account and all of your donations are gratefully appreciated. There's lots of perks on there, secret groups on Facebook. Do get involved. We would love to see more of you. Enjoy the episode today. Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. I'm very Thank excited you. today. Uh, I've got Jim Crossley with me. Hello, Jim. Hi. Uh, We're really uh, looking forward to this, aren't we? Yeah, we are. We are. This is going to be brilliant. So Jim Crossley is a naval historian, passionate about the war at sea. Uh, he's had six relatives at Jutland, including William Goodenough, who commanded the second light cruise squadron. Uh, he's written six previous books on naval history, but I'm really excited about his latest one, which I finished yesterday. So he's chosen to focus on one man. I think it's fair to say that this is one man. If you are interested in either of the wars, you know the name but you're probably like me and you don't actually know what he did or where he did it exactly. I have a feeling he was around Gallipoli at some point. Jim, we're going to talk about Roger Keyes today, aren't we? Yes, Roger Keyes, uh, Admiral of the, of the fleet, uh, Sir Roger Keyes, actually. Yes, we should, get, we should get all of the titles in at the beginning. Um, yeah. Tell us <clears throat> why you decided to write a book about him. Well, he's a sort of archetypal... Um, naval officer of the Edwardian period. Mm -hmm. He very clearly demonstrates uh, both the uh, weaknesses and the strengths of the Royal Navy at that time. Um, he is also, um, his close relationship with Churchill actually sheds a great deal of light on the character of uh, that great man. And um, I think, uh, um, uh, probably puts it in a light that uh, many people don't know. <laughs> we'll get to Grandad, won't we? Because you've we actually indeed, called yes. the book Churchill's mm. Admiral because he spanned two wars uh, serving under Churchill. Um, can you tell us a bit about his background? Was he always destined for the Royal Navy? No, he wasn't. Um, his uh, father was a general in the, uh, in the Indian Army and uh, he brought his infancy was in India and then... Uh, like, uh, like lots of other people, including uh, uh, Kip Kipling, um, he was sent to England to a, uh, um, a, a, actually a, a vicar's family to, uh, um, uh, because the Indian climate was not healthy for young people. And um, there he was somewhat abused, um, but uh, he was, um, uh, his father wanted him to go into the into the uh, army, um, but he was very strong character and he was very persistent and um, he defied the general and uh, uh, managed to get uh, sent to the Navy instead. It's a good but, job for yeah. the Royal Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, his early career took him to China, didn't it? In what capacity? Uh, well, he went to China as some... Um, uh, a commander of a, uh, a, a destroyer, which was uh, destroyers at that time were very, really quite small ships with a crew of about 35 people. Uh, and uh, he went as commander of a, dis of a destroyer, but uh, because he was so keen in getting involved with the fighting, he, um, he, 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 he left the destroyer for a lot of the time in, uh, in charge of the second in command and uh, went ashore and uh, went with the army to uh, uh, Beijing and um, uh, fought on foot uh, very, very bravely um, against the Chinese. This was the Boxer Rebellion. Mm -hmm. um, very hornblower, isn't it? It's very hornblower. Couldn't be more hornblower. Yeah. yeah. This is what I love about the Royal Navy of, Navy of this time is the, um, the opportunity to just show initiative. Oh, yes, and they fought on land very much more than they fought at sea. I mean, nobody dared to fight them at sea, but mm -hmm. on land, of course, they fought a lot in the sort of minor colonial wars and, uh, and indeed in the, in, in, in the Boer War. Is he particularly promising at this point? Uh, he is a, a, a bit of a maverick. Um, uh, he, he is a, a, a very fine destroyer captain, and he gets managers to do with his destroyer things that uh, have never been done with small ships before. 
Um, so he was very good at that, but he was a bit undisciplined. He, when he went ashore in China, he was actually defying the admiral who was, uh, um, who was in charge of the whole fleet. Um, and um, he got a severe, he nearly got relieved of his command, but he, was, he had such personal charm and um, uh, such a reputation for gallantry that um, uh, he was forgiven and um, went on to higher things. So let's let's bring Churchill into the story. So Churchill becomes first uh, first Lord of the Admiralty in 1911, doesn't he? Yeah, when did right. he first notice Keys, and how does their relationship start? Well, he noticed Keys almost immediately because Keys had been uh, came to end of his career in submarines and he was made um, in, in, in destroyers and he was made um, uh, uh, the um, officer responsible for developing the submarine force. Um, Britain already had uh, quite a number of submarines, although they were, a lot of them were very primitive boats. Um, and uh, Keyes was given the job of developing them and developing their sort of fighting tactics. And uh, Churchill was always on to anything new, and he loved the idea of the submarines. Um, uh, almost his first week in, uh, that's Churchill's first week in office, yep. he came down and got a, went underwater in a submarine with Keyes in command and got very excited about it. And uh, so um, that was really how the relationship began. I think that Churchill does the same with tanks, doesn't he? It, you're right, anything new. Absolutely anything... right, yes, tanks, armoured cars, anything like that, uh, and aircraft actually as well. Which I like to think, like, this is what I'd be like. I'd be like, oh, new shiny machine, and I'd be completely sidetracked yeah, as well. That's, that's why you've got the man Churchill, you see, there you are. There you go, yeah. <laughs> yeah but I love that, <laughs> that boyish aspect of his nature to get excited about anything yeah. new that uh, comes up and to get behind it, uh, even if I think there must be some nonsense ideas in there as well that, that didn't make a difference in warfare, which it would be interesting to look at. Um, so let's talk about the First World War. Key mm. is at Gallipoli, isn't he? Yes, he um, he was sent to Gallipoli, but he, he didn't get on well with, uh, with uh, Fisher, who of course uh, came in as first sea lord um, uh, uh, at the beginning of the war, and uh, Fisher um, uh, relieved him of uh, command of the submarines and uh, sent him to Gallipoli, and uh, where he was chief of staff uh, to uh, Admiral de Roebuck, who was uh, in charge of the naval operations there most of the time. Um, uh, he, Keyes was an extremely active, he, he got the reputation as he, he got the name of that mad sailor. He <laughs> was always going ashore and uh, fighting with the, with, the, with the troops and um, he was strangely embarrassed by the fact that uh, whereas the army were taking lots and lots of casualties, the navy were taking practically none. And he, he actually sought more casualties. I mean, it's an extraordinary thing, but he did because uh, he thought that um, uh, the Navy was losing face uh, and, 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 and uh, could be accused of cowardice in its, uh, in its attitude to the, um, uh, the Dardanelles operation. That's a wider feeling in the Navy, isn't it, during this period of frustration, definitely before Jutland, at not playing their part and wanting to get involved and watching everything happen on land. That's absolutely right. And uh, this huge force, which was uh, so superior to any other, was, was just sitting there doing nothing. And the Germans, of course, had exactly the same thing. The, the, the uh, German fleet was held in great contempt, except for the, uh, uh, except for the U-boats, because, uh, because it sat there doing nothing while the soldiers were all getting killed on the, in, in, in the trenches. It makes perfect sense in a way, doesn't it? I mean, if you had spent a fortune on a shiny new Ferrari, you wouldn't send it into battle. And that's essentially what these huge ships were. They were expensive, they were coveted, they were precious. Um, and I think definitely in the German case, I think maybe the British Navy was just a bit too superior, wasn't it? And like, yeah, it was, yes. Really and... to fight them. So, mm. yeah, which is what all the U-boats are about, because it's a way of getting around that superiority, isn't it? 
Yes, absolutely, and 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 uh, and uh, uh, very nearly succeeded in doing so. He does serve with the Grand Fleet as well, doesn't he? Yes, uh, uh, very uneventful. He 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 was captain of a battleship, and then he was in charge of um, uh, a, 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 a division of uh, of three battleships. Um, he was. Um, uh, but it, it didn't, didn't see any action at all. Um, uh, there was one occasion when the fleet went out because they thought the Germans were coming out. Actually, they weren't. Um, and on that occasion, his ship happened to be in dry dock, and he went nearly mad uh, because uh, <laughs> because she couldn't join the uh, she couldn't join the fleet. But anyway, no fighting happened, so it didn't make any difference. I'm gonna. Um... <clears throat> well, make people read the book to find out more about the Grand Fleet stuff, because I guess that's what everyone wants to know is about his time yes. serving with, with the big boys. But what really interests me, can you explain to our listeners, because I love this, can you explain to them what the Dover Patrol was? Oh, well, the Dover Patrol was the most active part of the Navy throughout the war. Mm. Um, it, was, uh, uh, it was based, uh, surprisingly enough, in Dover. And it had the responsibility, the Dover Patrol had the responsibility for uh, keeping the channel open for troop ships and supplies going to France. And uh, not one troop ship was sunk during the war. It was responsible for um, uh, stopping submarines, German U boats, getting down channel and out into the Western approaches where they could uh, uh, torpedo merchant ships. And it was also uh, a, a, an important function was to keep a bit of pressure on the right flank of the German army. So they were always uh, having to deploy quite a lot of troops and artillery in Belgium where there was no fighting going on, but they were always afraid that the British might land, which indeed they did at the Zebra Parade. Yeah. So uh, um, it was a constant threat uh, to uh, um, uh, to uh, Germany, and that was one of the roles of the Dover Patrol. Because, of course, we came very close to doing it in seventeen, didn't we, with Operation Hush as well, which was yes, yes. Rawlins, I think it was Rawlinson and Fourth Army. But I'm not sure if it's called yeah Fourth Army um, yeah. coming in on the coast as well. So it was definitely that they could never take their eye off it, could they? Yes, that that, that was actually in the days of uh, uh, Bacon, who was um, uh, Keyes's predecessor in charge of uh, of, of, of the Dover Patrol. Another, actually, another very interesting man. But uh, his um, book is wonderful, actually, on the Dover Patrol. If people want to know more about that madness, it's yes, great. I strongly recommend that. It's a mm. wonderful book. So, what does so Keyes? You've mentioned he succeeds Bacon, who's probably the famous one that commands the Dover Patrol. So, how does he do? Uh, he takes a very different view to Bacon of almost everything. Um, he didn't like that. Bacon. He called the streaky one. <laughs> I love naval officers. It's so bitchy. I love it. Yeah, I didn't like him. Anyway, uh, he, he um, uh, Bacon was uh, was very negative about most new ideas for catching submarines. Okay. Um, and particularly, um, the idea was uh, to uh, force them to the surface by putting down mined nets. And then uh, illuminating them and uh, and uh, 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 destroying them with gunfire. Um, Bacon didn't like doing that because he thought that it was too dangerous for the boats that were doing the dis destruction with gunfire. Um, uh, Keyes um, uh, 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 totally disagreed and um, uh, did use gunfire and and, and actually um, uh, uh, eventually succeeded in more or less completely stopping U-boats getting down the channel. He was he was successful in that. Um, he was also successful in in uh, uh, making the Zeebrugge raid into onto uh, um, uh, onto the uh, harbour at Zeebrugge. Um, it it was a, a very very uh, expensive in casualties. Um, it was. Um, uh, it only held the the harbour for a, a few hours, um, and um, it was it was really, by most standards, a disaster. On the other hand, it did 
shake the Germans considerably. And mm. they really started to lose morale uh, um, after the Zeebrugge raid uh, for um, really complex reasons, which are difficult to, uh, to understand. But uh, they, they, they realized they had a vulnerability there, which was, um, which was very positive for us. And, 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 and also it gave a terrific flip to the general morale uh, of, of, of the country that um, uh, suddenly we raided the, the coast held by Germans and, we'd, uh, um, and we destroyed the lock gates, which actually we hadn't. Um, and um, uh, uh, we'd uh, uh, done something to stop submarines getting down the channel. So it was a, it was a huge morale flip to the nation. It was, and as well, some absolutely astounding stories of bravery as well, connected with the men who served in those raids. That's quite extraordinary. And, 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 and another interesting thing is that uh, um, Keyes insisted that all the men involved should be either Royal Navy or Royal Marines. Um, he wouldn't have a, a, army men on at all. Uh, just to even up this thing about casualties, I mean, it was an extraordinary obsession with him. You would have thought that he'd He'd, he'd, he'd try to use uh, experienced uh, army officers uh, to uh, at least um, uh, give some guidance, but he wouldn't. He wouldn't have it. He they they all had to be sailors. Some inter-service rivalry there. I actually so I knew um, I was worked with Jeffrey Drummond, the VC winners family. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah mm. on because he was an Etonian, so he's in the naval chapter of my Eton book. So yeah, uh, some astonishing sort of. <clears throat> it's it's weird isn't it because they're they're very royal naval they're very um the raids are very ad hoc they're very hornblower like they're very um sort of initiative based as well there was a plan but the plan disappears very quickly doesn't it and you've got a lot of individual small groups of men yeah yeah exactly um yeah. and uh, um uh, a total uh, underestimate of the uh, of the difficulty of uh, um landing under 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 fire um uh, everything was reduced to a shambles and it was only the terrific courage of these chaps, a lot of them Royal Marines, mm. who um, they achieved anything at all. So you've mentioned the morale dip to the German Navy and of course the German Navy is where it's the beginning of the end for Germany itself really in terms of like the whole order collapsing isn't it with the mutinies at Kiel? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so it goes, uh, how does he see the end of the war then? Does, is he involved in the surrender of the German fleet or um, when they're interned? No, how he, no, he wasn't involved in that, I, I think, at all. Um, he was, um, uh, at, at, at the end of the war, he, 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 um, he spent a lot of time going around on uh, um, sort of morale-raising uh, expedi uh, expeditions. Um, and being made uh, um, uh, uh, free men of various cities and that sort of thing. He was, he was treated as quite a hero. Um, also, he uh, was running, there was a lot of toing and froing of politicians and, uh, and, and senior officers between France and Germany. And he was more or less running a, a ferry service of destroyers doing that, um, uh, during which they had some, uh, some quite quite exciting uh, um, incidents. And uh, uh, then he was also responsible initially for uh, sweeping up the tens of thousands of mines which both sides had, uh, had laid in the, um, uh, in, in, in the Western approaches and in the, um, uh, and, and, and in the channel. Um, so uh, there was a lot of mine sweeping to be done. Indeed. Um, what does he do during the interwar period? So we now have sort of a break, obviously, yeah. with active service in terms of fighting the Germans. He's not very popular at all, is he? No, he's not. Um, he made a lot of enemies um, uh, for various reasons. Um, one, he was, uh, he was um, uh, very opposed to the formation of the Royal Air Force, or who really took over the um, uh, the Royal Naval Air Service, um, which, and he was very upset about that. And he argued the case with a lot of senior people, which made him unpopular. 
Um, he also um, wa became CNC Mediterranean, which was the sort of top job at sea for a for a, a, a an admiral. And um, uh, he was not a great success in that role. Um, he was uh, considered to be too much of a playboy, spent too much time playing polo and that kind of thing, and, and, and not enough on, uh, on, on, on the ships. There was also a ridiculous incident um, uh, called the uh, Royal Oak incident, um, where there was a, a, a a, a row on one of the battleships in the uh, in, in, in the Mediterranean fleet under his command um, and um, uh, somebody called the bandmaster uh, a, 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 a nasty little bugger and the band retire, retired and, 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 and somehow this got back to the papers in the UK and there was a it got blown up into a tremendous scandal. The king uh, got involved and was absolutely furious. Um, and um, it, 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 it really did tarnish Keyes's reputation in a big way. Um, he, he also, of course, uh, was a strong supporter of Churchill and, 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 and didn't like disarmament. He didn't like the um, Various naval treaties, um, which reduced the uh, the uh, superiority of the of the Royal Navy, um, and um, uh, he 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 was really up against all the fashionable trends at the time, mm. and he made himself very unpopular. He um how does their relationship go in the interwar period? Because I I can with, see with like, Churchill. Every... Yeah, so they're very pragmatic in terms of when there's a war on. Obviously, they're great pals, but are they? Is it the same when? There's... Oh yes, uh, uh, he was. He got on very well with Churchill between the wars, although they, Churchill, uh, disagreed with him as far as the uh, formation of the RAF was concerned. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they, they they got on very well. Churchill um, encouraged him to go into politics and he did he became uh, mp for portsmouth um overturning a strong labor majority um they, uh, they and, and 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 they made great friends um churchill invited him to join his sort of um uh private club that he ran and um uh, obviously very much enjoyed his company um, and um, uh, he was, uh, it, it was one of the wonderful things about Churchill, that he was able to sort of uh, uh, comprehend all these uh, um, different sorts of people in his, uh, in his friendship group, and um, uh, Keyes was very much a part of that. Um, so <clears throat> it's perhaps unsurprising then, in 1939, Churchill returns to the Admiralty, um, and he, he has keys back, doesn't he? Is this a game changer for keys? The beginning, obviously he's going to serve in another war, yeah. but in terms, if the war hadn't have happened, was he done pretty much? Is this a revival of his career? Yes, I mean, by this time he was getting on. He was, too, he was in his sixties and he was too old for, um, uh, for active service. And what he longed to do was to go do the same sort of things as he'd done in China. And, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 really, he wanted to, and uh, uh, the the big um, the big thing was he wanted to make a raid on the Italian island of Pantelleria, and um, he, he 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 the the scheme involved him going ashore from a destroyer and. Um, uh, sort of charging into the uh, onto the island with a bayonet. Well, you you don't do that when you're an admiral of the fleet um, and nearly seventy years old. Yeah, we love this about you, chaps. Though, Jim, you're always twelve <laughs> years old, even when you do get to admiral of the fleet and you're in your seventies. There's still that little boy in there. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd be a bit more cash, cautious than Keyes was. I must yeah. say. <laughs> <laughs> and he does, and yet there's a theme still, isn't there, with his being involved in in new things because tell us about the part his part in the history of the commandos 
Yes, well, now the commandos were was uh, was Churchill's idea. He thought that you could form a little group of uh, uh, of, of, of highly trained um, and uh, very uh, 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 aggressive um, uh, soldiers and Marines, and you could land them in France or on the German coast or something like that as sort of pinpricks. Um, it, 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 it didn't work very well. There were the, the only two successful uh, operations of that. One was the Bruneval raid, where um, uh, Marines went ashore and, um, well, and soldiers and captured a German radar station and brought all the equipment back. And the other one was, of course, the great uh, San Nazar raid, which was a great success of uh, blowing up the dockyards in, uh, in San Nazar. Um, that was done by people trained by Keyes, but it, they were both happened after he had uh, been um, removed by Churchill from command of the commandos. Um, he trained the commando forces, but he didn't, uh, he never actually led them or directed them in battle, um, which was a great disappointment for him. <laughs> yeah, probably sensible. Yeah, probably sensible. <laughs> he, he is of an older persuasion mm. at this point. Um, but one thing that he remains good for during the Second World War is PR, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. He was very good at PR, and 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 uh, uh, he, he he used to go around uh, uh, factories and uh, th there were a lot of strikes, you know, in the, in the factories and coal mines. And he used to be sent to the place where the trouble was to give uh, rousing speeches. And he was very effective at that. Um, although he wasn't a great public speaker, he, he had a sincerity um, and uh, he used to meet union leaders and that kind of thing and um, uh, uh, talk them into being a bit more loyal to their country. Mm. Um, and he was, he was able to do that, it's surprising, but he was. Um, and he was very useful, he used a great deal in that role. And, and, and then of course, he was quite a hero with the Americans for various reasons. Yep. Um, he'd, uh, he'd, when he was with the Dover Patrol, he took uh, a, a lot of American admirals to see him sub in um, destroyers and things, which uh, they found very exciting. And um, so he had a great reputation in America and um, uh, he was able to uh, uh, to meet with um, uh, uh, with President Roosevelt, and um, he he was able to do a good a good PR job from that point of view. And uh, uh, then, of course, he went with the um, uh, Pacific Fleet to the the the, the, the great uh, the great Battle of, of Leyte Gulf, um, where um, um, where unfortunately he breathed in a lot of um, phosphorus smoke, uh, which ruined his lungs. Um, but it was all part of the sort of PR thing. And um, he was, uh, he was, he, he turned out to be very good, very useful at that. Yeah, absolutely. And they, um, <clears throat> that was something that obviously that role was down to Kitchener in the first part of the First World War, going around and giving those sort of speeches. So you had to be of a certain standing didn't you to walk exactly back exactly to people yes. who didn't want to work and explain to them look if you don't then the war efforts are good basically yeah, exactly right yes that's uh, that, that's just what he did um, and uh, he did the same thing actually in australia uh, the australian uh, uh, um, shipwrights were, wouldn't wouldn't work on at weekends and one thing or another on repairing ships and uh, he gave them a terrific bollocking and um, <laughs> <laughs> He's it, a character, uh, uh, appealed to their better nature. Uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, I think I think it was it was quite effective. Yeah, I think he definitely is a character as well. Uh, let's just finally, how important is he to Churchill in the first half of the 20th century? I think he was very important to Churchill because he was a personal friend. Um, not really, uh, uh, never going to be a politician. He just didn't have that sort of brain. He was a personal friend. He was not a threat to Churchill, um, although he opposed his ideas sometimes. Um, he was, uh, um, and, and, and I think Churchill regarded him as a, um, as a kind of beacon of uh, a, a sort of behavior and a sort of, um, 
pure character, which he didn't encounter in the political sphere. I mean, all, 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 all politicians, part of the job of, of mm. devious and, uh, and uh, uh, cunning. And Keyes was the reverse of that. He was not devious, he was not cunning. He was just a straightforward good egg. And I think Churchill, with his wonderful ability to attract people of, uh, and, 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 and communicate with all types of people, felt that he was a very good balance against the politicians that he uh, he normally was dealing with. I think, yeah, sometimes you just need a break, don't you, from all the machinations and the scheming and the, the sort you do, of you do. nature uh, of politics. Yeah, I mean, the, the Churchill had to give him the most terrific bollockings from time to time because he, 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 he um, he was um, being so rude about the Admiralty and calling them all cowards and all that. But <laughs> Churchill really, but you know, the, 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 the Churchill was able to calm all that down and 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 and, and see what a fine fellow was uh, was uh, was behind it all with, uh, with 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 good motives. Jim, thank you so much for coming on and introducing us to Admiral. Roger Keyes. Uh, the book is brilliant. The book is uh, Churchill's Admiral in Two World Wars. It's out now. We'll make sure it's available via our History Hack bookshop online as well. Do buy it. It's wonderful. And do check out some of Jim's other books as well. There's a particularly good one that was a centenary book about Jutland as well. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, very nice to talk to you and um, best of luck. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack. Or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great 